This month's artist was chosen by viewers via the Deep Discog Dive decision. I'll be picking next month, but feel free to suggest artists in the comments to cover. And check out the Spotify playlist in the description. It has all the songs from this video and more. Enjoy. Welcome back to the Deep Discog Dive. I make billboards now. It's how I cope with the problems in my life. You might know me for iconic billboards such as, I drink too much coffee. I spent all my savings on Donkey Kong merch. I'm not that knowledgeable about Green Day's back catalog. Well, today's the day I fix one of those. Today, we're talking about Green Day. Let's dive in. The story of Green Day really begins with a venue in the San Francisco Bay Area. In the mid-1980s, 924 Gilman Street, otherwise known as Gilman's, was as much a community as it was a physical space, an all-ages, volunteer-run venue that many of the punk bands on the West Coast would have killed to play. One of those bands was Sweet Children, made up of drummer John Kiffmeyer, bassist Mike Durnt, and frontman Billy Joe Armstrong. Inspired by acts like Operation Ivy and The Replacements, the trio played in any basement, backyard, and building they could find. They were eventually discovered by Larry Livermore and signed to his label, Lookout Records, in 1988. Their first EP, 1000 Hours, was released the following year under a new name, Green Day. It was the name of a song they had written before, but the name actually comes from this special event that happens in the Alps every thousand years. Haha, <laughs> just kidding, they named the band after weed. The year after the EP, in April 1990, 39 Smooth dropped as their first proper album. And boy, yeah, this is definitely their first album. 39 Smooth is fine. It's a perfectly acceptable debut album. The lyrics are mostly about young love, young frustration, young boredom, basically just being young. I also feel like the production and mixes hamper the potential this album had. I recognize it was a trade-off to keep their homegrown energy intact, but knowing where they'll go from here, it's a shame to see some of these songs held back by amateurish production. But even at this early stage, that raw energy still shines. Tracks like The Opener at the Library, I Was There, Road to Acceptance, and especially going to Pasalacqua demonstrate that the band had that je ne sais quoi that you can't fake if you want to be a success. So no, Green Day's first album isn't an instant classic, but it's clear that their music had a lot of potential if given the chance to grow. Like weed. Literally a week after 39 Smooth was released, Green Day went back into the studio, recorded their second EP, Slappy, and released it in the summer of 1990. Slappy, along with 1000 Hours and 39 Smooth, can be found these days as part of a compilation album called 1039 Slash Smoothed Out Slappy Hours which I could have sworn was the name of a Kingdom Hearts game. After their first US tour, the gang planned to record a follow-up, but when Kiffmeyer left to go to college, they were without a drummer. Through Livermore, Armstrong and Durnt met Trey Cool. They hit it off, and Cool was brought in first as a temp replacement, and then as their official drummer. The new trio went back into the studio to record Kerplunk which released in December 1991. In terms of production, this is in the same ballpark as 39 Smooth. The biggest upgrade is in the drums. Kiffmeyer was a fine drummer, but hearing Trey fly all over the drum set fits Green Day so well. His energy is what takes tracks like Private Ale or Who Wrote Holden Caulfield from mild toe tappers to full on headbangers. Plus, it was here where I began to notice how melodic Mike Durnt's bass playing could be, the breakdown in Welcome to Paradise in particular. Along with Billy Joe's growing skill as a lyricist and vocalist, you can feel each member of the band developing their style and gelling together into one cohesive unit. The production still holds holds it back from true greatness for me, but again, this is as someone who knows their later sound looking back on what they used to be. You might personally like this rougher take on the band. In fact, I've seen a ton of people look back on Kerplunk as one of the best Green Day albums, including Billy Joe himself. And for good reason, it is the best showcase of the DIY spirit the band had in their early days. Personally, I think they will make better albums than this, but for those of you who click with it, I think you'll love it. Following Kerplunk and the buzz it garnered them, Green Day did what any band would do. Get a bookmobile, drive to the East Coast, and hashtag hustle, hashtag grind to get their name out. Their obscene work ethic led to Kerplunk selling 50,000 copies, a remarkable feat for a band on an underground label. It almost makes you think, what if they had a label that was 
above ground. God, that was awful. A bidding war kicked off with Green Day choosing Reprise Records as the victor. They were drawn to them because of producer Rob Cavallo and how well they hit it off with him. Reprise would go on to put out every Green Day album up to this video's release. But the major label signing came at a cost. The move to Reprise led some to peg Green Day as sellouts, eager to cash in on Punk's rising popularity for their own personal gain. Not to mention, Gilman's would soon enact a policy preventing any major label act from playing there. Green Day were, effectively, barred from the place and community that had been so instrumental to their success. Granted, the guys in Green Day were good sports about it and knew what they were doing. Heck, they even let Lookout Records keep the rights to their first two albums, so any money made from them would go to Lookout and not Reprise. That's neat and cool. But the question then is, would it be worth it? Were the band callous sellouts who would lose all magic with the major label move, or would the increase in resources and talent behind the scenes lead to something truly special? I'd say they picked that second one. Green Day's third studio album, Dookie, was released in February 1994. Dookie is a sweeping, sprawling opus complete with a full orchestra and poignant musings on the human condition. Nah, just kidding, they named it after poop. Dookie is a lean, no-frills collection of pop punk. I would say there's no BS on here, but again, Green Day honed their songwriting and playing to be as focused and razor sharp as it has been thus far. Plus, with the help of producer Rob Cavallo, the band managed to clean up their sound without diluting their chemistry. And sure, that means the DIY sound of the first two records isn't there, but honestly, I don't miss it much. A perfect example of why is the re-recorded version of Welcome to Paradise. The cleaner production means more impactful drums, more audible harmonies, and that breakdown I mentioned earlier feels even more chaotic. The other big singles, Basket Case and When I Come Around, are instantly memorable. And to be honest, I'm kinda sick of them. Yeah, this'll be a trend for me going forward, but after hearing them so many times over so many years, Green Day's bigger hits have lost a lot of their initial impact for me. I will represent this feeling anytime it pops up from here on out with the overplay octopus. Anyway, here's Wonderwall. That said, I still love Longview, especially that bass line. might be one of the best things Green Day has ever written. Can I also just say, these guys might be the kings of the oblique vocal harmony? A quick bit of music theory, an oblique vocal harmony is where one voice stays on a note and another moves. Sometimes I give myself the creeps. On any track they're used, Pulling Teeth, She, Welcome to Paradise, even Basket Case, they sound so tight, it's the kind of songwriting device that I don't think would be as appreciable if the rougher production was still present. Overall, the hooks are infectious, the sound is banging, the lyrics are juvenile but down to earth. Dookie is early Green Day, distilled down to its most compelling core. It's one of the definitive pop punk albums of the 90s, if not all time. It's good. Dookie helped make pop punk a dominant sound of the 90s and established Green Day as one of the most talked about bands in pop culture. It wasn't just because of the music either. True to their sound, they were often rebel rousers during public appearances. Their performance at Woodstock 1994 is infamous for its mudslinging. And not like insults, I mean literal mudslinging. But their remarkable success didn't stop the sellout status they held in certain circles. As they began work on the follow-up to Dookie, not only were they dealing with their status, and not only were they pressured to top their star-making record, but they were dealing with personal matters. Billy Joe got married, and both he and Trey had kids. And so, for musical inspiration, the band turned to what many bands turned to when making the follow-up to their breakthrough album. The Darkness Within. Insomniac was released in October 1995. First off, the lyricism on this one is the most unique thing about it. The last album was lyrically focused on the same things Billy Joe had been writing about since 39 Smooth. Love, boredom, that good old 90s societal ennui. Insomniac, though, is driven more by frustration and loneliness. Whether it's about the effects of drugs on Geek Stink Breath or about their rejection from Gilman's on 86, Billy Joe's words have a heightened edge to them. So lyrically, it's fascinating. Musically, it's dookie. Not bad, 
I mean, like, like it's very similar to the last album. Of course, that's not a bad thing in and of itself, and the band were still driven to push and refine their sound even further. The raucous opening of Panic Song, which was so brutal for Trey to play that he tore the calluses on his hands. The thick layered guitars that permeate tracks like Stuart in the Ave and No Pride. That ominous descending line on the album's biggest hit, Brain Stew. The album can often feel like it's mad at you or attacking you whether you're someone who called them a sellout or someone who hopped on the Dookie bandwagon. Insomniac is good and fascinating in ways that Dookie wasn't. It was initially pegged as a disappointment because it only sold 4 million copies. God, what losers, am I right? But as time has gone by, it's received more positive attention. It even got a 25th anniversary deluxe release this year. That said, it's good in the way that, like, Room on Fire by The Strokes is good. It deserves recognition as a great body of work on its own, but it can't help but stand in the shadow of what came before. Despite liking it a good deal, critics also agreed that Insomniac was too similar to what came before. The gang toured for most of 1996, however, between the larger venues they were playing and the time away from their families, they felt at odds with their place in the culture. So they canceled the European leg of the tour, spent time at home, and wrote a heck ton of songs. These songs were meant to remove Green Day from the confines of punk, each being a chance to play around with their usual sound. By the end of recording, 18 songs were picked to form Nimrod, released in October 1997. And I'm not even gonna play around with you. This one is great. With Nimrod, Green Day managed a very tight balancing act between the sound they'd become known for and the sounds of their experimentation. The violins in Hitchin' a Ride get a lot of credit as being the first sign of where this album's gonna go, but I also love the scream Billy Joe does right as the song explodes. Last Ride In would be a perfect soundtrack for the scene in a spy movie where the main character sneaks into an evil headquarters. Redundant from a lyrical point of view might be Billy Joe's crowning achievement thus far, the kind of ballad that's schmaltzy on the surface and darker when you look deeper. Also, they put ska on this thing? King for a Day is legit a ska song. What is the world coming to and why do I love it? Even the more minor details that show the band thinking about how these songs fit together. For example, I love the blink and you'll miss it transition from Jinx to Haushinka. And hey, if you want more classic Green Day fare, you've got tracks like Nice Guys Finish Last, Scattered, and Reject. But given how much experimenting they did on Nimrod, it makes sense that its biggest hit was the biggest left turn the band had taken up to this point. Good riddance, time of your life. An acoustic guitar-led breakup ballad with an honest-to-god string section that, according to the band, took 30 minutes max to record. This became one of Green Day's most iconic songs. But the overplay octopus strikes again because I've heard this song too many times to count. But I will acknowledge that's in some part because it's a well-written and well-produced song. And it does work very well as a penultimate track. I... I am shocked at how much I like this album. Whether they're sticking to what's worked for them before or experimenting with new sounds, the songs on Nimrod show Green Day at their most vibrant and carefree. It's the kind of record that is fun because you can feel these guys having fun making it. Very much worth your time. Nimrod was a breath of fresh air for Green Day. So of course, people didn't like it that much. Reviews at the time were fairly mixed, the main sticking point being that it was too different from their usual sound. It just goes to show you, never create anything. After touring for Nimrod, the gang went back into the studio. Inspired by Good Riddance's massive success, the band wanted to take more risks with this album. One such risk was not bringing back Rob Cavallo. This is the first record that Green Day were producing themselves. The fruit of their labor was Warning, released in October 2000, and it continues the experimental edge that Nimrod started. The bones of Green Day are still present in every song, but it's the small additions that make the difference. Many of these songs are based around acoustic guitars, and the band throw in new timbres like a harmonica on Hold On, or even a frickin' sax on Jackass. Misery is not only a showcase for Billy Joe's growing talent as a storyteller, but the songwriting gives off what I like to call VVV. Voodoo Vince vibes. The opening title track is instantly infectious with this repeating guitar line and chorus harmonies. And sure, it's a bit of a kinks ripoff, but hey, I'd be a kinks ripoff if I could. It's a really small moment, but I love this bit in Castaway where Billy and Mike sync up on the downbeat. It reminded me of, get this, 
Outcast's Church? Don't think that I can get out this hole. I guess I'm just a sucker for the sync up. And of course, I'd be a fool if I didn't call attention to Minority, a shining example of Green Day working at their peak. The kind of accessible sing-along that works whether you're in a pub with your mates or in an arena with thousands. It's also the first Green Day song to have an explicitly political background. The song was inspired by the 2000 US election. Once again, I am taken aback at how much I like this. Oftentimes, when a band spends albums trying to experiment, the results can be hit or miss. But the past two albums are basically all hits and no misses, and they show that Green Day are not one-trick ponies. If only people recognized that at the time. Warning was a commercial low point for the band. Part of its underperformance can be attributed to it leaking early on the nascent Napster. This next break between albums would be the longest Green Day had taken so far. The group were starting to feel disillusioned with their place in the industry. They were perceived as elders of their scene, and all the kids were busy laughing when old people fall. During this break, we got a live EP, their first greatest hits compilation, and a B-Sides record. The gang recorded their next album, a back-to-basics punk rock record called Six Cigarettes and Valentines in the fall of 2002. The plan was to release it in 2003, that is, until the master tapes were stolen in November of 02. Now this would have kicked off a rousing episode of Where in the World Is That Guy Who Stole the Green Day Tapes. Instead, with the help of the returning Rob Cavallo, the band used this time to reflect on the boiling tension, set aside time to process their emotions, and establish a creative environment that would welcome input from each member. The band spent most of 2003 recording a completely new album, though in the meantime, Billy Joe's label released an album by new wave group, The Network. Here's a photo of the band members. If you've ever wanted to hear what the love child of Green Day and Devo would be, this might be right up your alley. It's a sound that fits surprisingly well on Green Day. Oh, excuse me, The Network. As this new album progressed, the band also wanted to incorporate current events into their work. So, what was going on in the U.S. in 2003? U.S. warships and planes launched the opening salvo of Operation Iraqi Freedom. The U.S. was engulfed in the then-young Iraq War, a topic that nearly all pop stars totally shied away from. I want to emphasize that. The vast majority of popular music in the early 2000s did not touch politics at all. The overwhelming initial support of the Iraq War meant that any kind of opposition was harshly condemned. However, by 2004, support was starting to wane, making it the perfect time to drop something that touched on that growing frustration. And boy, did they drop something. But not like that. In September 2004, American Idiot was released. I feel it's important to be upfront with you about my nostalgic biases. I basically grew up with this album. I was like nine years old when it first came out, and it was in part the soundtrack to my middle school days. So keep that in mind when I tell you this highly controversial take. The album is good. American Idiot is described as a punk rock opera, taking inspiration from David Bowie, The Who, and The Beatles. The opera follows a loose coming-of-age story about a teen who gets sick of his small town and moves to the city. Two of the lead singles directly tackle the Iraq War, but the rest focus on media, reality TV, bigotry, massive corporations, and that good old brand of 2000s social apathy. Of course, all of that means squat if the songs don't bop. Thankfully, the songs bop. The title track is quite possibly the best album opener the band has ever made, and Holiday is the rare overplayed single that hasn't lost its appeal to me. Wake Me Up When September Ends is about the death of Billy Joe's father, and while it's proved fertile meme ground for nearly 20 years, oh god, this thing is nearly 20 years old, its emotional resonance is still intact. I personally can't say the same for Boulevard of Broken Dreams. Again, as a song, it's iconic, but I've personally just heard it way too much. The most surprising songs on here, though, are the longer ones. We Are the Waiting and St. Jimmy are two halves that complement each other so well, with Waiting's memorable sing-along chorus crashing abruptly into the more frantic Jimmy, or Give Me Novocaine using an acoustic guitar passage to segue into She's a Rebel. Jesus of Suburbia is a 10-minute, five-part suite that never gets dull. I think what makes these long songs work is the fact that they can easily be separated into their own smaller pieces. So these are longer songs, but they're not 
long songs, if, if that makes sense. Helping these songs is killer production that manages to be loud without being overpowering. It's the kind of mix that looks like a sausage, but sounds also like a sausage, but like a really clean sausage. So yeah, Green Day not only revitalized their career, but effectively made the anti-war musical statement of the 2000s. Who would have thought? American Idiot catapulted Green Day into a renaissance. Critical acclaim, hit singles, a live album, awards aplenty. Not to mention, the album came at a perfect time. I mentioned the shrinking support for the war, but the botched response to Hurricane Katrina made American Idiot an even more relevant album. Between American Idiot and its follow-up, we got another Green Day affiliate band, Foxborough Hot Tubs. Here's a photo of the band members. Okay, in fairness, this time Green Day were up front with this being their side project. An old school garage rock album that's better than what you'd expect from a side project, and if you're into garage rock, I recommend it. The band began songwriting for their next album in 2006, though they wouldn't start recording until 2008. When they did get back into the studio, they did so with producer Butch Vig, famous for records like Siamese Dream, Garbage is Self-Titled, and oh, there was, there was a really big one, but uh, I'm, I'm spacing on it now, never mind. In May 2009, 21st Century Breakdown was released. This one is once again a rock opera following couple Christian and Gloria as they make their way in late 2000s America. It's way looser than American Idiot's already loose narrative, instead aiming to capture the mood of American life at the time, as well as Billy Joe's own psyche. Make no mistake, this is the most personal album Green Day have ever made, and I think as a necessary result, it carries a lot of weight with it. To me, these songs work best when they show clear growth in Green Day's songwriting. The titled track does a good job of kicking off the album, both in terms of the lyrical themes and the kind of vibe Green Day would be going for. Static Age builds to its climax with multiple key changes in the second half, which I thought was great. I really enjoyed the piano-led Restless Heart Syndrome. Apparently most of the songs on the album were written on piano, and songs like this, Viva La Gloria, and Last Night on Earth make me wish they used piano more often. I also do like lead single 21 Guns. I think it's one of the songs where the melodrama drama is at its strongest, even if it does give me flashbacks to Transformers 2 Revenge of the Fallen. But while there are great songs here, the more mundane moments tend to drag the project down for me. There's a lack of the bulletproof hooks that carried American Idiot to massive success, and that wouldn't be a huge deal normally, but it ties into the album's biggest misstep for me, its 70 minute runtime. This is, as of this video, the longest Green Day album. So 70 minutes of this more contemplative side of Green Day can eventually get tiring. 21st Century Breakdown is the kind of album where I like the idea of it more than the execution. I commend Green Day pushing themselves, and there are certainly moments where they nail it, but I also wouldn't recommend it as the first Green Day album to listen to. First off, let's get the big news out of the way. Green Day got their own rock band game. An honor bestowed to only the greatest of bands, like The Beatles, Lego. The band toured for 21st Century. From those shows, they made and released another live album. They also released a Broadway musical. Yeah, American Idiot was adapted for the stage in 2010. From reviews, it seems like it was a good time, if a bit shallow. There were also reports that the album would be made into a movie. Said reports would continue for another decade until the film was squashed. After the musical's debut and some more shows, the band went back into the studio. You might have noticed this, Green Day's albums up to this point have moved in pairs. The DIY era, the major label move, the maturation in sound and lyrics, and the political rock operas. Well, for this next set, they did the unthinkable. Basic Edition. In early 2012, Billy Joe announced that Green Day would be releasing a trilogy. He said that these albums came from a period of sheer creativity, of these guys making themselves at home in a studio and doing what they do best. I would make a joke about a trio of musicians making a trio of albums, but of course they had to squash that piece of comedic gold by adding a fourth member. That's right, for only these next three albums, their touring guitarist, Jason White, was a main member of the band. The first part of this trilogy was Uno, released in September 2012. This album was intended to move away from the rock operas and more towards good old fashioned power pop. And in my opinion, yeah, that's, that's what they did. Uno is a fine return to Green Day's more basic years. 
At its best, the band come fairly close to writing the same kind of effortless earworms they became known for, such as Nuclear Family, Carpe Diem, Let Yourself Go. That said, while the album is fine, it's also, well, that, it's fine. The kind of transcendent moments Green Day reached on American Idiot or even 21st Century are just gone. And hey, I get that was part of the album's mission, but while most of these songs aren't bad, they also don't leave much of an impression. The one track that people bash the most is Kill the DJ, Green Day's attempt at dance punk. Now, when I heard that, I was actually kind of excited to hear what they might do, but unfortunately, Kill the DJ is less House of Jealous Lovers by The Rapture and more Paralyzer by Finger Eleven. It feels way too slow, and Billy Joe's vocals come off as uninterested. As a return to basics, Uno is fine, but I don't know, I can't help but feel like it's bogged down by a bit of filler tracks which isn't a good sign considering this is the first in a trilogy. Next up in the trilogy is Dose, released two months later in November 2012. Kicking off this one is See You Tonight, a short and sweet acoustic intro. It makes you think that this album could be a more intimate companion to Uno. The next song is called F*** Time. Oh, baby, baby. Oh shoot, would you look at that? I knew I was late for something. No, for real, these guys made a song that sounds like their take on Lil Richard with lyrics about f time. Cringe, there's no other word for it. This makes me cringe, it's embarrassing. Look, if these guys wanna recapture the carefree spirit of their early days, I get it. But the past few records have shown that they're capable of writing energetic barn burners that reflect where they are in life. So to see this kind of childish regression on tracks like f time or make out party is just cringe. Also, why does everyone harp on Kill the DJ when nightlife exists? Imagine Green Day doing AM era Arctic Monkeys with awkward rap verses. Yeah, it's not great. I can't believe I finally get to say this. I don't have much else to say about Dose. Dose was framed as the garage rock album of the trio, harkening back to their work as Foxborough Hot Tubs. In fact, the aforementioned f time was originally a Foxborough song. That said, I mean, Green Day were already throwing in filler on Uno, and Dose has even more. Aside from the cringier cuts, there's not much memorable about this one. Closing out this trilogy is Trey, released in December 2012. The album's name is based not only on the fact that it's the third part, but it's also a dedication to Trey Cool. I'd say that was nice of the band, but it's a shame that this was the album they chose as a dedication. It's filler. There's no other way to put it. It's almost all filler. You won't hate listening to it, but I guarantee that'll only be because it's all fairly inoffensive. The only tracks I can recall a specific feeling from are X Kid and 99 Revolutions. Otherwise, I'm honestly having difficulty remembering if I even listened to this at all. So taken as a whole, did this trilogy need to be a trilogy? No. Again, I appreciate the band's effort to push themselves. And there is a solid late period Green Day album somewhere spread across these three albums. But I can't recommend in good faith that you devote time to find it. Green Day did not slow down after the trilogy. There was a documentary about its making, another documentary about the Broadway adaptation of American Idiot, and the 99 Revolutions tour kicking off. It makes you think, these guys have a remarkable work ethic, but there's gotta be a tipping point. Like, Billy Joe, don't you have one minute for yourself? You're gonna give me f one minute? Okay, sorry, geez. During their performance at the 2012 iHeartRadio Festival, Billy Joe flipped out at having their set cut short, called out Justin Bieber, and smashed his guitar. Now let me say up front, that can suck. Earlier performances had reportedly been running long, Green Day got shafted, that frustration is fair. But also, take that part out, and the rest of the performance was... A little off? Following that show, the band released a statement apologizing and clarified that their set wasn't actually cut short. Billy Joe checked himself into rehab for substance abuse, and many of Green Day's upcoming shows were either canceled or delayed. This small break gave the band a chance to recoup and focus on themselves. The only things the band as a unit released between the trilogy and its follow-up was a demo collection called Demolicious. Following his time in rehab, Billy Joe was fairly prolific. Not only did he team up with Nora Jones for a whole album, but he also got into acting, 2014's Like Summer Like Rain, and 2016's Ordinary World. Jason White also left the group to tend to his battle with tonsil cancer, a battle that he did end up winning, and perhaps biggest of all, 
Green Day were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2015. It was around that time when Rob Cavallo teased work on a new Green Day album. And a new Green Day album there was. Revolution Radio was released in October 2016. The best way to describe this one is a mix between American Idiot's political frustration and the energetic focus they were gunning for on the trilogy. The album looks at the socio-political climate of its time, attempting to capture what it was like to be alive during 2016. The biggest example, and the album's lead single, Bang Bang is about the drastic rise in mass shootings in America. Like their two rock operas, it also makes room for multi-part suites like Forever Now, piano-centric ballads like Outlaws, and acoustic guitar passages like The Closer Ordinary World. But of course, they also leave room for the bangers. Bang Bang, the title track, Troubled Times, Somewhere Now, these tracks capture the kinetic spirit Green Day had been known for without veering off into f In total, yeah, a damn fine album by Green Day. Harkening back to their youth without coming off as childish, incorporating the songwriting they had learned over the past decade, and writing some killer tunes in the process. After touring for Revolution Radio and a brief break afterwards, Billy Joe said the band had a bunch of tracks ready for a new album. Said album would be their take on glam rock and, quote, old-timey rock and roll. Following that news and a few singles, Father of All, released in February 2020. I would read the rest of the title, but it's being blocked by Horny the Unicorn here. I did not make that up. That is actually what they named the mascot of this album cycle. These guys are almost 50. I would say Horny the Unicorn is the perfect metaphor for this album, but it's actually this billboard. No features, no Swedish songwriters, no trap beats, 100% pure, uncut rock. A bold declaration against the status quo, the kind of thing Green Day and punk rock as a genre were known for back in the day. Now let me say quickly, I'm not saying these guys came up with this copy, but the thing is, back in the day, that brash attitude was backed up with Dookie and Insomniac. If you're gonna make this kind of statement, you gotta come correct. Father of All does not come correct. The production on these songs feels so homogenized. Take out Billy Joe's iconic voice and songs like Meet Me on the Roof and Oh Yeah could be mistaken for, I mean, pick any semi-popular rock band still working today. Hell, the title track has Billy Joe doing this new falsetto and it basically comes off like the Black Keys doing Feel It Still. The fact that the whole thing is only 26 minutes long doesn't help that feeling of homogeneity. Given the quality of these songs, Father of All doesn't feel lean, it feels skeletal. Granted, it's not all bad. I happen to like Fire Ready Aim a good deal. I think it best captures the spirit they were going for. Junkies on a High wasn't terrible either. I liked its lumbering groove. As an album, Father of All is dreadfully mediocre. As an excuse to tour or as a way to get put in commercials, it's acceptable. I'm sure you'd be fine with hearing all of these songs at a concert, but they're gonna leave your head as soon as Longview or American Idiot start. And speaking of concerts. Grow up, Green Day. Shut the f up, Tom Selleck. Green Day were scheduled to go out on tour with Fall Out Boy and Weezer following Father of All, which makes a distressing amount of sense. They even announced it with this Anchorman parody featuring a nightmare fueled deepfake of Rivers Cuomo. Of course, that tour was postponed due to. From March to September 2020, Billy Joe recorded a series of covers while in quarantine. Said covers eventually became his first solo album, technically, No Fun Mondays. Nothing mind-blowing, but a nice little diversion. We also got the return of the network in December 2020 with their second album. And boy, their mustaches have only gotten bushier. This year, they put out that deluxe version of Insomniac, plus a new song, Here Comes the Shock. It, it's fine. After Father of All, their contract with Reprise ended, and they haven't renewed it. So from here, it'll be interesting to see what Green Day do next. The world is their punk rock oyster. If you want to get into Green Day, definitely start off with Dookie and American Idiot. And then from there, I'd say Insomniac, Nimrod, Warning, and then Revolution Radio, if you want an example of what a good late period Green Day album looks like. And if you have a favorite Green Day song or album or just related thing, I would love to know what it is in the comments. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have some more billboards to make. <laughs>